Hello and welcome. I didn't like that intro, but I'm going to keep it. Uh, welcome to the Good Journey Pod. I'm your host, Brady Josephson. Uh, every week I get to chat with thought leaders, innovators, and marketers from this world of good fundraising and philanthropy. We get to hear more about their stories and their journeys, which I hope in some small way can help you along yours. Today I'm joined by Vivian Hoekster and Linda Hartley. They are the authors of Big Impact, Insights and Stories from America's Nonprofit Leaders, as well as uh, Principles at H2 Growth Strategies. Uh, in the episode, we discuss some key findings from their book on nonprofit leaders, some changes in giving over the past 20 years, why charitable giving is stuck at 2% of GDP, and there's even a quick tangent on the pay inequality that exists within the fundraising profession, which, oh, by the way, is absolutely ridiculous. So anyways, I hope you enjoy the episode, and as always, thank you for listening. Hi, Vivian and Linda. Thanks for coming on the show. Oh, you're welcome, Brady. This is uh, my first multi-person interview pod, so thanks for kind of being my guinea pigs here. We'll see how it goes. Sure. Uh, I want to talk about your book, Big Impact, uh, but curious as to how you each ended up in the philanthropic space. Well, I can I can start I can start there. Uh, it's a it's a long story. I I was an actor for my entire school career, beginning in first grade. I uh, huh. joined an off off Broadway theater company uh, after I finished college, and uh, attended the NYU Graduate School of the Arts and acting. Uh, at you know at the theater company, uh, you know uh, my lead play my lead uh, I played the lead in uh, Lizzie Lies a lot. It was a children's <laughs> play. Uh, uh, it was not easy to make a living as an actor, as you might imagine. Uh, and through the theater company, I learned about fundraising. Uh, after that, I uh, I was I took a job at NYU in the uh, in the development office. They paid for my MBA at night, mm. and now uh, uh, with our own company for the last uh, 17 years, um, we have plenty of performing arts organizations and theaters that we work with. So mm. uh, it all comes around. <laughs> yeah, full circle. And you, Vivian? I had a slightly different path. I actually got an I got an MBA quite early in my working career having started in retail and found that it was not for me. Mm. And then I went into went back into the business world in marketing and discovered that I am very, really very mission driven. Mm. So I have to care a lot about the product or service that I'm selling. Mm -hmm. And so I found that most of the missions that I was interested in were being addressed in the nonprofit sector. And so mm. I made my way into the sector relatively early in my career. I was in my early 30s. Right. Yeah, I'm always fascinated to hear how uh, different people end up because very few people, you know, from an early age say, I'm going to be a fundraiser or, or I'm going <laughs> to, you know, be a nonprofit professional, especially on the fundraising side. So thank you both for sharing more of your story. Um, You're welcome. So I want to hear a little bit more about uh, the book, but <clears throat> maybe maybe the Genesis story or what what led you to write this book or why did you want to write this book in the first place? So, Linda, am I taking that one? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we we formed this company about a little over two years ago, having known each other for a long time and actually worked together uh, before we formed the company. And we have both been in the sector a long time and really wanted to both give back and also amplify the voices of the leaders who are making things happen in their communities and around the United States and around the world all day, every day, usually without a lot of recognition because we've worked with a lot of those leaders over the years and we know how wise they are. And we started with, okay, we're gonna interview a bunch of fabulous leaders. In the end, we interviewed almost 50. And we decided we wanted a, a book that cut across different issue areas within the sector. So you'll notice that the book has, it has performing arts organizations, 
It has educational organizations. It has international organizations. It has social service organizations. And as far as we know, there is no other book like it. There are books that address Christian leadership or Jewish leadership or even Mm. museum directorship. But we have found no book like ours that explores Leader, nonprofit leadership across the sector. Hmm. So that's why we wrote it. And how did you go about identifying or finding those, you know, 50 people that uh, you wanted to talk to? Like, what was the criteria or what was that process like? It was a combination uh, of our uh, combined connections, uh, hmm. people that we've worked with, uh, people that uh, people who suggested. Uh, and as Vivian said, we wanted a broad uh, uh, representation of the nonprofit sector. So, uh, in addition to uh, foundations and nonprofit organizations, we looked at uh, making sure that uh, uh, nonprofit media organizations were represented, uh, uh, social sciences, um, cultural organizations, health organizations, even religious organizations, nonprofits, mm-hmm. uh, advocacy organizations. Uh, so they they run the gamut from the Rockefeller Brothers front Fund uh, to the YMCA to Freedom to Marry um, to Do Something dot org, the Nature Conservancy, uh, New York City Opera, a client, um, Brady Center to Prevent Gun Violence, also a past client, and some universities as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that you know, in, in, in as in business. Uh, there is still a lot of white male leadership at the top mm. of uh, major nonprofits. Uh, so it, it we we uh, you know had uh, we had to pay attention to making sure that uh, the leaders were also uh, a diverse uh, diversely represented. Right. So without going down a, a huge tangent, maybe <laughs> just talk about that a little bit more because. Uh, you know, roughly the latest figures I saw are about 70% of all fundraisers are women, but it's almost inverse when it comes to the leadership positions being 70% male. Why, why is that? What's going on here? Well, uh, you know, uh, I'm involved in this uh, personally as well in terms of uh, pay equity um, right. advocacy. Uh, yeah. you know, I serve on boards that help to promote economic equality for women. And, you you know, part of it is connected to how people get paid Uh, and, you know, and and then how they're how they're treated uh, unequally. Uh, So that I think that that's part of it. And I and I think a solution and this is why we press on uh, legislation for um, uh, 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 equal pay for equal work or pay equity across job titles uh, is because uh, there's a respect that comes from that and also uh, power that comes from that mm-hmm. uh, when when you're paid uh, uh, equally. Mm-hmm. So I think that that's one solution. Uh, why, why, why these things happen? Because they can, because mm-hmm. women can get paid less. Uh, they're, they're really, you know, they're really, it really does boil down to that. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, the whole thing is, is obviously, um, in equal <laughs> or it, hmm. it's, it's ripe with kind of injustice, but the thing that just blew my mind, uh, when all these, you know, stats and studies come out in the fundraising industry in particular, which is so heavily driven and functioning through all women <laughs> primarily like it's largely women for there to be still such a huge gap is is i think it's a big black eye on the profession but that's a whole different conversation well, well you know <laughs> nurses uh you know versus doctors or uh, uh librarians uh you know once a an, uh a profession is feminized it even gets you know it it, it, it becomes more of a challenge oh interesting hmm. Well, uh, side topic over, uh, back to the book, (laughs) um, did anything really surprise you or jump out, uh, to you as you went through all those interviews and discussions? A a number of things. One is that, uh, we, we noted that, like, I think it was about maybe 25% of the leaders we 
interviewed had experienced tragedy in their early lives, Hmm. and often it drove their career choices. So, for example, uh, Tara Perry, who runs the National Court-Appointed Special Advocates for Children, which I think is based in Seattle, was herself a foster child. And that is what, and so she uh, it was eventually adopted, I believe, but uh, was not able to live with her family of origin. And that really drove her career choice of, and, and she's made her way to the top of this relatively large organization. And an, another example would be Dan Gross, who until very recently was the uh, CEO of the Brady Campaign to Prevent Gun Violence. He was a 30-year-old, so he's not. this is not in his childhood, he was a 30-year-old uh, partner at J. Walter Thompson, which is one of the biggest ad agencies in the world. And so he, and he was the youngest partner ever, and his younger brother was shot on top of the Empire State Building and almost died. And a friend of theirs was actually killed. And as a result, Dan really very carefully rethought his career and switched into the nonprofit sector and eventually came to run the Brady campaign. Hmm. So that's another example. Uh, yeah. Would you? I, I can give you one more. So Hillary yeah, Pennington, please, please. who works at the Ford Foundation, grew up in a household where her younger sister was uh, very uh, developmentally disabled, and Hillary is obviously extremely bright, and you know she's uh, almost at the top of the Ford Foundation, and she said that that. That really drove her choices in wanting to work with people who can't necessarily speak for themselves Mm. and 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 gain their own rights. Uh, And that's that. So that's yet a third. I could give you lots of others, but it it really is interesting. That that was very interesting to us. And there, there are there are other things as well, but that was. Particularly, uh, and and that sort of it, it sort of wrapping around that is the emotional intelligence of these leaders, mm-hmm. where it's it's clear that even even when they make mistakes, right, and and a lot of them admit to mistakes or blind spots, or they're they're really they're they're self aware, they're mm-hmm. focused on. Uh, righting the wrongs, and they're really in tune with what's working and what's not working in their own organizations. Right. Um, so, I was just having this uh, conversation with a former former colleague. Uh, we used to work at a large organization, and we saw multiple leaders, both in in his kind of division and my division, come in from for profits, like brilliant, successful people. And um, I think maybe there was a little bit of a lack of understanding the nuance of nonprofit, but there seemed to be maybe less of a, a focus on that EQ or the emotional side, just kind of, you know, more like I'm, I'm the brains you're going to do as I say, and it, it just never seemed to work for our organization. Do you, do you think that's a contrast maybe between some for-profit leaders? And I know now we're talking in, you know, grand gener- generalities here, but uh, is there more focus on the, the emotional or EQ side for, for nonprofit leaders, do you think? You know, it's it's a, we we at, we've asked ourselves that question, and and mm. we should just say we're not experts in corporate leadership. Right, right. My own. Uh, so the the answer is we don't know. We 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 maybe think that it there is more <laughs> focus on that in right. the nonprofit sector, but we certainly couldn't prove it. Gotcha. And and you know, the, when we when we asked uh, those we interviewed, what would you tell young people? Uh, considering entering the nonprofit sector, uh, I think that this is telling, is that, you know, it's it's following your passion, because I think that that's what they did. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, 
and, and you know, this, that, that's not the, you know, um, that doesn't, that doesn't only happen in the nonprofit sector, but no, of course, yeah. it may be that it happens more, more often. Right. Um, so that, and some of them talked about how one of them, uh, said there really is no work life balance. It's just life. And yeah. <laughs> he tries to bring his life to all parts of his, his world. I thought that was a very good, uh, way to, to, to look at, uh, um, being a leader. Yeah. Um, so without spoiling uh, the whole book, <laughs> can you maybe share maybe a, a, a tip or a tidbit or something that you found maybe for people listening that are leaders themselves and nonprofits that, who are thinking, you know, how, how can I improve or get better? Like what are some of those traits or commonalities you found about great leaders that people should aspire to other than following your passion? Mm-hmm. So we actually came up with seven principles for making positive social change. They really, they frame, those principles frame the book. And this is based on talking to these 47 leaders. And one of the things that I think is important is that we call it ensuring your own house is in order. Mm. And it, it builds on what we were just speaking about because what we're what we've we're finding is that unless the organization is functional and or relatively functional it's not going to have as big an impact as it could right and so we and of course there are many many aspects of ensuring your own house is in order and uh we we can't we we couldn't possibly have listed all of them, yeah. Uh, but I'll give you an example of one. So uh, give your employees autonomy in decision making. Mm-hmm. That presupposes that you've hired really smart, self motivated employees because mm-hmm. it's not going to work <laughs> unless you do that. <laughs> uh, but uh, but that's the that's one aspect of because if. One of our interviewees, um, Shale Polakow Saransky, who runs the Bank Street College of Education in New York, said that one of the things that he learned most about leadership when he was a young teacher is that you want to tell your employees how you want, we want them to be very clear where point B is if you're standing at point A. Right, so point B is the goal, uh, and you, if you can give your employees clarity around point B and let them make their own ways from point A to point B, that is a that's a that's one of the best ways I've ever heard of describing what's meant by giving your employees autonomy and decision making. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's funny that. The the lack of autonomy uh, is actually a bit of part of my story about why I left working for a nonprofit. And that was what was most frustrating, you know, being slightly mm-hmm. underpaid or, you know, these weird hours. That wasn't a, a problem. It was I really wanted to, to do stuff and felt like uh, I couldn't. I kept kind of, mm-hmm. you know, kept micromanaged or we couldn't try anything because of the, the risk averse culture. And again, there's mm-hmm. all kinds of reasons that it comes from. But especially when you look at the kind of next workforce, that that autonomy is just rising in importance for better or worse <laughs> in terms of what, you know, millennials are looking from employers. And I think it's something that nonprofits should be embracing and giving to people in spades so that we can get talent because they're less motivated by money and status in theory than maybe in the past. But if we don't give that autonomy, they're just going to, they're just going to leave. Well, uh, millennials and and us included, we've had uh, <laughs> different experiences, uh, some positive and and some uh, not positive, and, and that same thing. You know, going from one major university, mm. having lots of autonomy, being really excited about what I'm doing, right. and you know, you know, being a junior person and still you know being being given that autonomy was yeah. so exciting. Yeah. Uh, I took another job. Uh, it was a higher level job, more money. It was at a a, 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 a major, another major nonprofit, not a university, and I I was treated like a clerk. Mm. And it was very frustrating. So yeah. it, you know, it, 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 um, 
the interview process uh, helps, I, I think. You know, isn't it, it's hard to avoid those kinds of things sure. but in choices. But I, I, I counsel people, to uh, young people in particular, to really look at uh, buying and not selling when they're looking at, a, at their interview. You know, hmm. you're interviewing them as right. well. And, yeah, you know, important. you really have, you know, every, every step you take is, is going to be more important to you than to them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and, you know, including what the outcomes are. So that's, you know, uh, you know, mentoring, I think, uh, mm. ha- helps to play a role in, in, uh, uh, avoiding those, those things. Because, you know, even high quality, even if you say hot, you know, f- go to high quality nonprofits, you know, it, it, it's good to even check their references or check check the person uh, that used to work there. Yeah. 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 It's it's hard to get a sense of, of an internal organization culture sitting in a boardroom talking to a person or two over 30 minutes or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, it's really tough to, to you know, okay. figure that out. Those are some good yeah. good tips and points. Um, and the leaders, the leaders on in this uh, that we interviewed, uh, you know, said that they hired slowly and hired quickly, right? Yeah, so taking right. time, you know, and, and it, it, if it's not a fast, if it is a fast interview process, you might even be more worried about it, right? Mm. Uh, it would it would be better to even ask for more interviews. <laughs> right. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I want to jump tracks a little bit, uh, still related to obviously your work in the, in the book, but just talk about maybe philanthropy in general, because you know, between you, you've got 55 plus years of experience. So interested on, on your thoughts here. Um, what's, what's one of the biggest changes you've seen in the philanthropy space in the past 10, 20 years? So, and is this mine or yours, Linda? Sorry. Sure. You can take that. I'm going to take the last one on charitable giving. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, so the um so one of the biggest changes has been the emergence of this phenomenal phenomenally large huge big wealth right so the the emergence of um the bill gateses and mark zuckerbergs and uh and so this sort of rush of new money into the mm. philanthropic space and Actually, it, this is something that we uh, that we address in the book. We ask the um, we ask many of the foundation leaders, these traditional foundations, um, what changes are happening in the sector as a result of all this new money pouring in, and we got a whole range of answers. Everything from the new philanthropists really don't know what they're doing. <laughs> to the new philanthropists are focused on specific issues that they care about. So we at the foundations can focus on the underpinnings, meaning it's a good thing, all this new money, mm-hmm. to somewhere in the middle, right, where it's either uh, it's neither all good nor all bad. But mm-hmm. there seemed to be a consensus around uh, they definitely are bringing new energy to yeah. Philanthropy, even if you don't necessarily agree with their uh, strategies and tactics. Right, right. Well, and that's, that's a good changes. That's a good segue into the the charitable giving uh, question. Where, as a percentage of GDP, we've been basically stuck at two percent plus or minus point one percent for almost forty years, um, and so it really hasn't grown very much. Why do you think that is? And uh, what do we need to do to change it? Um, and hopefully some of this new new money and new energy will help with that. But interested, interested in on your take there. Sure. Uh, I, I don't know why that that is. Uh, that, and we, we use those numbers as well uh, when we conduct trainings. Uh, it, it's, it, it's a huge amount of, of money, uh, but mm-hmm. uh, c- compared to what uh, – or you know, for instance, the business sector makes in profits, it, it's not. And I'm going to tell you about two nonprofits that are, are trying to change that or increase giving. One is uh, called um, uh, the Committee to Encourage Corporate Philanthropy. 
It was started by Paul Newman, and uh, one of the people that we interviewed, Bob Forrester, is now the CEO. He was Paul Newman's advisor and is now the CEO of the uh, Newman's Own Foundation mm-hmm. and Company. Uh, that's another innovative uh, model there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the Committee to Encourage Corporate Philanthropy, uh, the CECP, uh, uh, talks about how um, there's, you know, more than 200 of the world's largest companies represent $7 trillion in revenues and $18 billion in societal investment, 13 million employees, and $15 trillion in assets under management. Wow. Uh, what they're doing is encouraging, uh, you know, they're joining together to uh, increase the amount that they give. Uh, from you know the, the 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 pie is as you know 85% comes from individuals including bequests typically every year mm-hmm. in philanthropy uh, another um, 10% comes from foundations and another 5% comes from corporations so they're trying to increase that that typical 5% mm-hmm. out, that's given out every year from corporations uh, another another um, I think uh, uh, organization that's making a difference in in that uh, because they understand this as well actually comes from the 85 percent uh, uh, the inv- individuals. It's it's Warren Buffett and his mm-hmm. giving pledge. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, asking the world's wealthiest individuals and and families to dedicate the majority of their wealth to giving that back. So mm-hmm. the, they they're. Uh, I think those or uh, those efforts should be su- supported. Another example is um, Charles Feeney of uh, Atlantic Philanthropies, where he's chosen to give uh, uh, the vast majority <laughs> of his uh, wealth away uh, through his philanth- and, and close down his philanthropy. There are there are also others that you know say, "Here's my foundation, but we're we're going to spend it down. We're going to close it out. Mm-hmm. We're not going to." You know, keep it, you know, and there's there's reasons to keep an endowed philanthropy going, and sure. you know, and this as well. But so the, those those are some of the things I think that are uh, aware of the fact that there there's more that can be given, and you know, in an organized way. Yeah, yeah, I, I uh, I've always kind of been baffled by that uh, as well because I think uh, people today at least are um, wanting to be perceived as more generous or um, we care more about caring, if that makes sense. Uh, and so even if you look at like search trends over the past uh, 15 years, people are more actively searching for things like doing good or caring, but not necessarily like give to charity. And so I, I think just how people are viewing how they do good has shifted and nonprofits and charity isn't seen as like the first and only place to go and do that anymore. People can purchase more benevolently. They can you know, um, work for companies and feel like they're giving back that way. Uh, so I think a lot of this good energy is just being diverted away from the nonprofit kind of official structure, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Some of that's good. You know, the power of business is immense. and The more that businesses can do good outside of charity, that's great. Uh, but I do think there's an issue about charity's attractiveness and being perceived as the go-to spot to do good that I think we have to work, work on, but that's another podcast in itself. (laughs) Right. I want to add one other thing, though. It's uh, and, and it's been a sh- uh, uh, you know the number of nonprofits I think have nearly doubled since 2000, and I think that that's a, a, a problem. Yeah. Uh, there's a role for for new nonprofits uh, because they they push the envelope. Right. Uh, uh, but uh, some uh, a lot of them don't end up scaling. Yeah. Uh, and and you know going out of business. So part of their strategy, what, what we advise them to do is, you know, consider as part of your strategic plan when you're a startup. Once you've accomplished a certain amount, uh, consider merging with a nonprofit uh, that you know, assuming you can you know make it work, yeah. uh, so that you can sustain uh, the energy and 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 uh, advance the mission. Yeah, mergers, mergers and acquisitions, nonprofits is something that has been really interesting for years now. It's tough because we don't have that 
that lever or mechanism in terms of equity, which makes those um, that process a lot simpler. Because <laughs> um, you know, I, I just my family went through a, a merger with acquiring a nonprofit, and just kind of being behind the scenes was really interesting. Because there's really no assets for the most part that you can um, easily distribute for a lot of the times. It's a lot of people and it's a lot of service delivery. But parsing out the merge and acquisition gets really emotional, which then gets really mess, really uh, messy in a hurry. But totally agreed. There's so many nonprofits that just can't scale and uh, they should be folded into ones that can or uh, merge with other ones that can help them. So. Yes, while be, um, they're at while they're in a success successful position, not when not on the downswing, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's not a great position to to be in. Interesting. Um, well, I'm sure we could spend hours talking about all kinds of other stuff, but I really appreciate you um, uh, writing the book and for all that you do and taking time to come on the show today. Uh, where can people learn more about you and your work? So they can go to our website, which is. H, then the number two, and then the word growth, G R O W T H dot com. And if they add a slash book to that, they'll go right to the page about the book. Otherwise, they can look at the whole website. Perfect. Well, thank you very much again for uh, taking so much of your time and sharing some of your wisdom with us today. Thanks again for listening to The Good Journey Pod, a nonprofit supply company production. Be sure to subscribe and get all the past.